Inside every museum is a hidden world. Now cameras are going behind the scenes at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Wow, look at it, they're catching the light already. Look at the company. Oh my goodness. Home to more than two million wonders of art, design and performance. Looks Boston. He looks all right, doesn't he? Oh, look at that, a bit of history. It's not something I was expecting to ever come across in my life as a conservator. This year, many of us have had to stay away. But behind closed doors, the work must go on. And now I'm giving his nostril a good clean, so that was particularly dirty. Tommy Tittlemouse is the only bear in our collection that gets birthday cards in a post addressed to him. Inside the stores, new discoveries are being made. It's like a collector's mark here, oh. right in the middle of the drop. Isn't it weird? <laughs> Fragile treasures are being restored. The problem is that they have been in storage for about 150 years. And masterpieces brought to light. You can almost see fingerprints on his bottom. Oh, yes. Preserving the best of the old and the new for all of us. We need to make sure that in 100 years' time, our grandchildren will also be able to enjoy them. Every day, curators explore the museum's vast stores in search of hidden objects that may have been forgotten. It's always an exciting moment for me when I can really delve deep and look through an archival box and discover the perfect object for the exhibition. We are about to show things to the public that are not normally on display, they're very seldom on display, so you feel like you're really bringing something new to the fore. One rediscovery a few years ago, made while reordering the stores, is a rare set of ten Chinese paintings called the Ten Kings of Purgatory. These paintings were always there in our stores, and we discovered them. And they all were rolled together uh, in a very poor condition, really, and we uh, realized that they probably have never been displayed in the museum over the last 150 years or so. The v &A records show that the hand-painted scrolls arrived at the museum in 1869. These 10 paintings were given as a gift by a lady called Mrs. Fortescue. Unfortunately, we know nothing about her. The Ten Kings chart the journey of the dead through ten courts of hell. Chop their heads. Terrifying, terrifying. In each painting, a king sits in judgment to decide the future of souls in the afterlife. While below, sinners face horrific torture. Like there's a noise, the sound the paper make. <laughs> They are not made by famous artists, but in such a spectacular style, reflecting the ordinary Chinese people's views, emotions, and the fears and desires. These paintings are among the rarest examples of the Chinese painting in our collection. Very, very unique. Restoring and displaying these 10 King paintings is one of the most ambitious conservation projects ever undertaken at the museum and will take 20 years to complete. Okay. King 10 has already been conserved, but after two years on display, his reign is ending to make room for his successor, King number nine. Conservator Susan is in charge of restoring the entire series of paintings. Oh, I love these kings. They're like old friends. You know, another one arrives and I go, and well, what have you been up to? You have this king sitting there in his throne, looking, you know, very regal. Some are old, some are new, you know, some are young. 
and then you look at the poor people who are being judged and then you go and you go, oh, not good. So that's always the exciting bit. The problem with these is that they have been rolled up. Um, so they, um, the rolling has produced creases, which they may have been there before, but um, have, they've been accentuated during the storage time. They're also on um, old linings, which are starting to um, pull away from the main painting. So the painting has become very vulnerable. It takes me a year to, to do all the work. So the time it's sat on a board for however many weeks, and then I've got to do the next layering and then it sits on the board again. And then the longer it sits on the board, the more stable it becomes. And so therefore, when it gets up into the gallery, it, the flatter it will, will remain. King Nine has spent a year in conservation and after some final touching up, is ready to go on display. And to keep this epic conservation project on track, Susan is now starting work on a new king so this is um, the next in the series. Well, I say next in the series, we're actually going backwards. So this is king number eight. I'm going to uh, give it a clean. Everyone gets terribly uh, worried because we're putting um, painted paper into water. So people tend to go, Ooh. After removing the surface dirt with a brush, Susan will apply traditional methods used by Chinese masters to clean the painting a challenging technique Susan learnt while studying in China. It is a learning process. No one object, even though they're in a series, is going to behave in the same way. This will involve pouring hot water onto the delicate surface of the painting, a technique not for the faint-hearted. The biggest challenge is its size. I am dealing with large, pieces of wet paper. And it's got no wet strength whatsoever. I have sleepless nights because the paper is so fragile. That's what I find difficult. On the other side of the museum, a rare find from more recent times is also being prepared for its debut on display. Theatre and performance curator Simon has come to conservation to inspect this new addition to the collection. I hear we've got a surprise delight for me to have a look at today. We do. It's always a joy for a curator when you see something from one of the most significant recording artists of all time. <gasps> wow, look at that. I mean, already <laughs> it's like the light is dancing off it. You can see this amazing beading, the sequins, crystal, the colours. Amazing, yeah. look at it. This edge is beautiful, this colour of edge of iridescent beads framing her face. It is fun. This jewel encrusted catsuit was created in 1969 for the one and only Shirley Bassey. Now you really see the, the gold inside as well. Yeah. It is really fun, isn't it? It's, it just makes you smile. You can hear Shirley Bassey. You know, I mean, it sort of screams Shirley Bassey and that personality. The skin-tight ensemble was among her most striking outfits and featured on the iconic album cover. Diamonds are forever of one of her biggest Bond movie hits. Among a whole wardrobe full of sequin studded outfits, the catsuit now in the museum was Bassie's personal favorite. With her powerful voice and penchant for glamorous gowns, the Welsh singer from Tiger Bay has recorded a record-breaking 35 top 40 albums in a career spanning over 70 years. But when love's gone, they lost her When Shelley Bassey originally auctioned garments from her collection, she said she was doing so for charity and wanted to see where they would end up. 
And it's actually thanks to our conservation department who spotted it at auction. And, and we were very, very, very lucky to acquire it. The extremely fine catsuit is crafted from silk chiffon and net, heavily embellished with sequins, glass beads and crystals. This material here is almost intended to be sort of flesh-coloured esque. Exactly, which adds to the effect. So we have these two layers of almost skin colour chiffon. It doesn't have much of a structure. So the body is giving it this structure. So that is a compliment to Shirley Bassey. <laughs> Diamonds may be forever, but after more than 50 years of stage shows, the costume is in danger of losing its luster. When you first look at something like that, you, you, you have the wow effect. <laughs> uh, so your eyes just wander through, through this uh, beautiful object. Uh, gradually, you begin to discover all the problems within this beautiful object. Performance costumes are really put through a trial. <laughs> Inevitably, there are areas of damage. Yes. As we look closely now, we begin to see these breaks on the net. And then we carry on moving up and we have the very delicate uh, silk chiffon, which along the front has many splits. Here, obviously, we've missed one. We've lost a bit. So the more you begin to look, you begin to discover all the problems. The catsuit will soon have a license to thrill the V&A's visitors when it goes on display for the first time but only if the painstaking conservation work is complete. For us to be able to have a piece of her career, a piece of that history mm -hmm. as part of the collection is incredibly special. It is. And actually that, that being so special is one of the reasons why I'm so keen that we get it on display. But the complexity of the diva's delicate outfit means many hours of work lie ahead. This is incredibly intricate, delicate material and probably one of the most complicated costumes I've worked on. So our team there really have their work cut out. Surfacing from storage for the first time, is an object donated to the museum two years ago. An eye-catching Victorian vase that hasn't yet had the chance to shine. This is a Bacchus vase. It was made by Minton in 1883 and came to the V&A as part of a bequest. In its day, this boldly decorated vase celebrating the mythological god of wine, Bacchus, was considered the height of fashion. I love this vase. I think the best thing about it are the heads of the satyrs that cover the surface, and they are all sticking out their tongues in quite a rude fashion. The half-goat, half-human satyrs are Bacchus's companions. The vase itself is made from a pioneering form of pottery known as majolica. This majolica vase is a wonderful example of the richly coloured glazes that so appealed to Victorian tastes. Victorian homes were quite dark places, so it appealed to people to have these brightly coloured objects which would kind of reflect light and add a bit of colour and vibrance into their homes. It would be great to be able to put this object on display. The perfect place to show off a vase dedicated to the god of wine is the museum's cafe, currently undergoing a refurbishment with a new bespoke mosaic floor. The museum has commissioned a brand new marble mosaic floor by contemporary designers which will be more sympathetic to the historic surroundings. In keeping with the museum's tradition of rooms as grand as the treasures they hold, the newly revamped space leads to one of the most impressive rooms in the V&A, built as a shrine to the art of Majolica. 
And I think the crowning jewel of the museum's building is really this incredible room. Um, it's the largest and the grandest of the three original 19th century refreshment rooms in the museum. And the primary feature of the decoration is really these incredible Minton Majolica tiles. When Minton was commissioned to decorate this, the Gamble Room, in 1868, it was for a noble cause. The V&A was the first museum in the world to have a cafe attached to it. Henry Cole, the museum's first director, believed it was very important to give visitors the opportunity to relax and enjoy a meal and a drink after they had spent time seeing the exhibits. And he wanted to encourage people to come to the museum in their free time and not go to the gin palace or the pub. But if the Majolica vase, also made by Minton, is to become a centrepiece in the new refurbished cafe, it must first go through rigorous conservation and cleaning. Then we've got this area here. And the vase will need a thorough examination before it can go on display. It does have a layer of dust and dirt which um, will need to be cleaned and in particular there are a few marks on the faces of the satyr heads which I'm hoping we can remove and hopefully put it on display uh, for the first time. In paper conservation, Susan will try a radical technique used by Chinese masters to clean King number eight. I feel like Widow Twanky when I'm doing this. But first, she must prepare the painting for this risky intervention. I've worked on two of them already. It doesn't necessarily always behave the same way. And I will start looking at it, you know, quite um, forensically. We have many cracks here within the paper. You can see the, you know, the, the paper that's beginning to break. You can see there's a little tear here. This one is to do with adultery and to do with um, sexual deviance, um, which always is, has a bit of you know, nuance. In the impartial King of the Eighth Court, the King of Fairness sits in judgment at the top, while sinners below charged with transgressive sexual crimes, are crucified by a green monster, or are chained up in harrowing scenes. Breaks coming down here. 150 years rolled up in storage hasn't been kind to the king either. I'm expecting this king to be very dirty. Just, you know, f from the age, from the, you know, the degradation of the paper, and I can smell it the sort of the mustiness. It's like going into really old bookshops. It's all sort of melds into that slightly sort of cheesy, papery smell. <laughs> Susan's tested sections of the painting with water and blotting paper to ensure that the colours won't run. Looking good. We work by risk. Start off with the, the least amount of risk and then you work up. Um, so the least amount of risk is testing the pigments so that I know that when I put water on them, I'm not suddenly going to be rolling off and being left with no picture. For the most drastic Chinese cleaning method, Susan must soak the painting in boiled water. So this is for the washing. Um, I use hot water. Hot water loosens up the degradation, but also it kills any bacteria. So hot water, using a brush, dropping it onto the surface because I don't want to touch the surface because as soon as I start getting the surface wet, wet paper tears. It's got linings. So although I'm getting it wet, the several linings are holding it all together. And so it's a bit like a sandwich. All right, so obviously a dry sandwich is going to be all sort of like, you know, dried up and up at the edges and, you know, sort of slightly brittle. 
When you start with a, with a sandwich, if you put water on it, it's obviously going to just, you know, completely go soggy and just lie flat. I'm ironing with a wet cloth. I'm pushing out the water and I'm getting it, and I'm getting it flat and I'm pushing out the dirt as well. I just decided that if I was going to do it, I was going to do it properly. And so I learned Mandarin and I, in order to be able to go and spend time in a, um, a museum in China. In Nanjing, Susan studied traditional Chinese conservation techniques under the tutelage of renowned expert, Zhu Qingwei. The first time I used this, I had a master who was uh, standing over me telling me it was all right. Hot water on Chinese paintings is all right, because I questioned the hot water, because it's not something that in the West we tend to do with our paintings. I wouldn't do this with a Rembrandt, I wouldn't. The paper that the painting is actually painted on is very, very thin. I don't breathe. I do not breathe. I'm sort of, you know, going, and also I'm sort of often going, please, let's just, let's just do this as you're supposed to be doing it. Yes, and, and I'm just gradually going down the length and I'm thinking, oh, this is looking good, this is looking good. Oh, this is not looking so good. It's all very well doing it when you've got a master with you. It's a completely different story when you've got to come back and do it by yourself. <laughs> but this is only the first of many washers. You have to be fairly diligent and you have to, you know, yeah, keep your wits about you. Respect the paper and just, you know, just behave yourself and get on with it. In textile conservation, Susanna is starting work on Shirley Bass's ornate but fragile catsuit. The, the base of the embroidery is kind of missing its bead. Fortunately, it was found, so it was kept in a zip, zip lock bag. We have decided to put it back. It's a costume made to create an impact. It's a beautifully designed and embellished. Dame Shirley wore this favorite outfit repeatedly throughout her career and 50 years of sellout stage shows have taken their toll. The problem is, as she performed, uh, as she moved, as she bent, as she twisted, the, the chiffon and the, all the weighty decoration has a split in some key areas. There are many, many tears in this costume, many. <laughs> It is quite tricky because I'm dealing with two very sheer layers. It's incredibly delicate fabric. Under the weight of the beads, it then pulls in, uh, in the opposite direction of the tear. So there are all kinds of tensions playing against each other. The decadent beadwork was the trademark of couture designer Douglas Darnell who created gowns for the world's leading ladies. Douglas Darnell was incredibly well-respected and in-demand designer uh, at the time and throughout his career. Given the number of people that he designed for, not only Dame Shirley Bassey, but Joan Collins, Marlena Dietrich, these people are at the height of their career, the height of fame. So who do you go to? The best in the business. And he is responsible I would argue, for creating that iconic bassy look, that extravagance, that flamboyance. Doug just doesn't make guns. I mean, they're, they're like buildings. I mean, he, he's, uh, a cons you know, he's an architect. He is just magic, you know. She's got the choice of the world she can go to, but, I mean, she usually comes back to me to do something. Mind you, I probably know her figure inside and out better than what she does, so I know all the best bits to show. Darnell's original design involved wide ostrich feather bell bottoms, and Dame Shirley wore this signature motif on many of her famous album covers. But to keep the catsuit up to date, Darnell tapered in the flares, and Bassie wore the revamped costume for her 60th birthday performance in 1997. 
She wore this at the age of 32 and again at the age of 60. And that is certainly quite impressive and remarkable to see that she maintained her figure <laughs> uh, all these years. To ensure this cherished costume survives many decades more, Susanna uses a specially adapted needle to stitch each tear in the fine chiffon. There is a slight curve now on the needle. And I'm going to use this fabric. So this is a very sheer fabric and we call Stabotex. It's polyester, so it adds a very good support. So I'm just pulling a thread. This is when it takes hours to do this, because the thread is the same color as my finger. Okay, and I'm going to do some anchoring stitches across. It is very important to, to progress slowly and consider uh, every step carefully. One does feel like an eye surgeon at times, it is true. <laughs> I decided to be kind to myself and ease myself in with a small tear, just to really get the feel to the, for the movement of the chiffon and uh, stitching with a thread surrounded by decoration, which is easily caught by the decorations. So I'm trying to, oh yes, I've got a knot, tiny knot. Threads are, are, are tricky with the fine thread. It inevitably curls slightly, and uh, if you're not keeping it in tension constantly, it, it, these curls can, can create a knot. It has turned out to be a big job. What is so difficult? The net is slightly pink and the thread is slightly pink, so they blend in beautifully, so it's very difficult to see. Stop. Okay, so this is done. Susanna will need to keep the thread in constant tension to avoid further knots. Next, she must reinforce the area with new netting and ensure the crystals keep their sparkle. I'm going to cut over the rhinestone to relieve some of the tension. It takes time and it's a process that we do not rush, especially when the object is destined for display to go on a mannequin. The costume will be under a certain tension, so it has to be strong enough to withstand vertical display. Over the next two weeks, Susanna must repair the many tears in the chiffon catsuit in time for its starring role in the gallery. Not every object on display in the museum has been in need of repair. Some are brand new. We are acquiring a new object into the collections and it's always really exciting to go to meet the artist. Sculpture curator Melanie is on her way to see one of the museum's latest acquisitions. Not only do you get to see the tools they use to make their objects, but also you see this piece. Hello. Hello, Hi. so Thank nice you. to meet you. you. Do, come in. I am very excited to be here. <laughs> well, it's great to show you my work. Joining the collection is a sculpture by Eleanor Lakelin, who makes art that on the surface looks like pottery but is actually carved from solid wood. She works really interestingly with the sculptural form using language of ceramic, but using furniture making techniques. The sculpture is called Echoes of Amphora and Melanie has come to see the finished piece. Wow, oh my God, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. The sculpture is carved from a single horse chestnut tree that had to be felled due to decay. The wood you used for this piece, does it have a story? The tree grew in Bedfordshire. There was a very, very large 
area that had become rotten. And then further up the tree, there was obviously, there was all sorts of nests came out and then um, various skeletons of birds. And that sort of started off the journey, actually. It was an enormous tree. So I, obviously I do know that it's several hundred years old yeah. because, I, because of the size of the yeah. tree. Eleanor's love of trees started in her childhood, growing up in Powys in the Welsh countryside. I was born in mid Wales, where hills start to become mountains. And I grew up on a farm. And so I spent a, a, a lot of time in the woods. It was as a child that Eleanor first became fascinated by what lies beneath the bark of ancient trees. I'm emptying out the inside of the piece. And then when I've got it half, empty, then I'll start to take off some of this bark so that I can get a sense of how deep the fissures go. She's interested in revealing the inner life of the trees, a kind of chaos beneath the bark. Uh, what a tree might have gone through in its life. So every single tiny bit of this bark has got to come off. I do find it quite interesting, this bit, because obviously nobody has ever seen this. It is a bit like excavation or finding something. When a tree has been damaged by insects, disease or animals, it will form a scar called a burr. It's this hidden part of the tree that Eleanor wants to show off in her sculptures. A burr really is, is a reaction, like we react to some kind of irritation. Sometimes people bang nails in trees or insects get under barks or there's an infection or whatever and the burr will kind of grow as a reaction to that. Um, and I think of it as a bit like, um, as a bit like a pearl forming, you know what I mean? That, that there's an irritation and then something else grows out of that that's really interesting. I find it just really mysterious and fabulous. But transforming a tree trunk into sculpture that resembles ceramics is an arduous process. First, Eleanor makes the most of the natural burr shapes by polishing the large areas and chiselling out the smaller ones. Where I've cut across the burr, this is now translated in a different, um, mm. a different texture, really. So when it's scorched, you can see all of that patterning. Eleanor then carves the sculptures so that they take the shape of classical vessels, known as amphorae, from ancient Greece or Rome. The burrs in the wood give the piece a look of broken pottery, as if it dates from thousands of years ago. I often think about imagining being a tiny little speck, in, mm. in, actually in it, you know, in that landscape, and surrounded by this anarchic, uh, texture and um, wildness. There's so many different elements that are coming into play in this object. And to some extent, she's cre creating a bit of a challenge for curators. You know, how do you define this? Where do you display it? Over the next few weeks, Melanie will have to find the perfect place in the museum to put this unusual piece on show. Back in the museum, while renovations are underway in the cafe, conservator Sophie must thoroughly check the Minta Majolica vase before it can go on display. This backer's head has quite a few issues. We've got paint splatters, some dust that's really settled into the crevices, and also we've got dirt that's become ingrained into scratches and abrasions on the face. When you get to spend so much time with an object, it means that you can see all the little areas of design and craftsmanship that you might otherwise not see. The details in the glaze on the leaves, the differences between the green and the brown, just building up texture on the leaves. I think that's something that's really unique. The vase was made by the Minton factory in Stoke-on-Trent in 1883 one of the most important manufacturers of ceramics in the Victorian era. 
and they were constantly technically innovating and leading in the areas of art and design manufacture. Minton pioneered new technology that enabled pottery to be painted with many brightly coloured glazes that could be fired all at once in low temperatures. One of their first examples of Majolica was unveiled at the Great Exhibition of 1851, where it was an instant hit, with Queen Victoria ordering pieces of Minton's Majolica for Buckingham Palace. It really became the most important and commercially successful ceramics factory in Britain and arguably even the world. If Florence is to display the Minton Majolica vase in the brightly lit modern cafe, conservator Sophie will need to ensure it looks its absolute best. So there was a few areas of ingrained dirt, so I decided to apply a poultice. Hopefully it will draw out the stain. The overnight face mask of gel and solvent calls for specialist instruments. So I've got a bit of a mixture of tools. Some of them um, I inherited from my granddad, who was a doctor. I think my granddad would be very pleased to see that his tools are still being put to good use. Even though they're not being used to fix humans, they're now being used to fix ceramic backers heads. <laughs> Once the backers vase has been given the full beauty treatment, it's hoped it can take center stage in the new cafe. In paper conservation, King 8 has had five hot baths to get him clean enough to display. It's filthy. Absolutely filthy. It's sort of like dung colour, you know, that yellowy, greenish brown. And you look at it and you go, how does a piece of paper hold that much water? Susan's carefully removed the old paper lining. But now comes the most challenging part of the conservation. The soaking wet painting needs to be hung upright on a special board so it can dry. I do get slightly stressed. I mean, it's, I have a sleepless night, normally have a sleepless night beforehand because I'm going through everything in my head. Well, I have to dye the piece of paper that we're going to put on the back. Because if you put in a white piece of paper on, it just shows up all the defects and doesn't, uh, it won't be beautiful. Right, so um, I'm using something called Yasha, which actually is a Japanese dye. It comes from the Japanese older cone. Yasha has been used in Japanese art since the 8th century. The yellow-brown colour, extracted from cones from the older tree, creates an off-white tone on the new paper. All these Chinese masters go, <laughs> what's she doing? Right, so now I've got to roll um, I've got to get this onto some blotting paper, get it to dry. Susan pastes the new lining onto the back of the wet painting and must transfer it all onto the board to dry using one seamless manoeuvre. The challenge of putting a first lining on is not to muck it up. It's like getting ready for a race almost. It's like, you know, OK, I can do this, I can do this. And it's like, OK, and we go, and we go, and we go, and we go. <laughs> and then you try to get to the end and you breathe. No, it is, it's exactly like that. It's the non-breathing, it's the non-breathing nerve-wracking. I need your hands, please. I've got to get this onto a, onto a board. Yes, there. The paper, when it gets wet, it's a bit like a single sheet of filou pastry. So if you, you know, imagine what that's like and it, how it easily it tears. Susan has prepared the board with seven layers of absorbent paper to help the painting dry flat. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm going. It's critical it goes on straight without any wrinkles yeah. first time. So she's recruited colleague Alan to help manoeuvre the two metres of wet painting. Just concentrate on the top. Sit straight. It's straight, actually. <sighs> but Susan spots the painting isn't on straight. <sighs> Why is the last bit always the hardest? Right. With historic cracks and tears crisscrossing the wet paper, it's vulnerable to damage. Look. 
It's not. <sighs> ah, table flat. With the painting hanging unevenly, Susan must react quickly to get the board horizontal. If you're going to be slightly unequal, then there's going to be pressure on one of the sides and you stand a chance of picking up an, on an old tear in the painting. And then it starts tearing across. Yeah. Oh, piss it. Oh, this is just becoming a disaster. In handling the painting, pressure and gravity have pulled at an old tear. Uh. It was a weak spot and it was just unfortunate that the, it should start, ex, it should hit the object exactly where that tear was. You don't panic, you can't panic, you haven't got time to panic actually, you've just, all your focus is is that, that you've got to stop this tear. Sort the tear out, breathe. Fortunately, the very fine paper is still wet and Susan has one last trick up her sleeve. So the magic thing about the filou pastry paper, you can actually sort of knit it together. It's sort of, if with a little bit of finger moving and a little bit of pushing and a, a bit of pressure, you can actually sort of knit it together. Oh, I think it's fine. Oh. Good for that. Susan has managed to stop the old tear from widening. She'll reinforce it from the back before making a second attempt to mount the painting onto the board. So my king, I'm just going to leave him overnight because um, everything has just got to settle down, including me. I've got to settle down, he's got to settle down, and then, yeah, we'll deal with the rest of it tomorrow morning. Finished, thank God. In textiles conservation, another delicate object is in need of very careful handling. After hours of painstaking conservation, display specialist Gazer is tasked with making a mannequin fit for a diva. So I want to create a look that is actually authentic. I want to make sure that the silhouette uh, is correct from all sides and angles. But I also want to make sure that there isn't any damage. The weight of the embellishment could potentially tear the very fragile silk chiffon any further, and this is something that we definitely must avoid. To help her achieve the right look, Gazer is using performance photos of Dame Shirley on stage as her guide. I, I just love the expression of hers. She's so full of energy. Um, images like this, they really help me to try to recreate the shape um, and let her come alive in a particular way. So we've decided to use a fiberglass mannequin. We can make sure that um, the figure is going to strike a really beautiful pose, which hopefully will do Shirley Bassey justice. The material that the beadwork is stitched onto is very thin and fine chiffon, and it's prone to be torn very, very easily. One of the bigger challenges is actually the dressing itself. We need to turn the mannequin around, don't we? Yeah. We need to be really, really careful that we don't introduce any further damage to the material by when dressing it. One false move and the outfit could tear. So this is a very tricky moment because the, the feet of the mannequin, they're really closely together. and We need to make sure that um, the, the decoration catches as little as possible. But dressing a stiff fiberglass mannequin gives them little wiggle room. There is only an ever so slight gap between the two feet and getting it over the feet without causing any damage to the object is very, very challenging. We're just trying to force the legs apart a bit as we do. Yeah. Okay, and just a little bit, yeah, that would be good to have a little bit more space. It seems to be a little bit yeah. twisted. Is it, is it the, yeah. is it something cool? Oh, oh, yeah. The heavily embellished crystals on the legs of the suit have got tangled at the ankles, pulling at the material underneath. Look in the middle there. Yeah. Is there something cool? Oh, I... Need to come round here. These mannequins, 
they're stiff. They won't just easy, easily raise their leg or their arm to help us stepping just into the costume. We have to do the work for them. We mustn't forget to breathe. Yeah, that looks, oh, that's that much looks better. better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're through now. Well caught, well spotted. Ooh. One, two, three. <laughs> the cat suit is slowly pulled up onto the mannequin without any damage. And Dame Shirley is finally on her feet. Higher. All right. To get the signature Shirley Bassey look, next the team attach some articulated arms. Now they need to create a pose worthy of a musical legend. This is a very special costume with a very special biography and worn by a very special person. To not have before had a piece of costume from somebody who's had such a sustained career, this is our opportunity to put that right. <laughs> Today is the culmination of months of planning for the sculpture department. There it is. The recently acquired Eleanor Lakin sculpture, Echoes of Amphora, has now arrived at the V&A. And it will be placed on display for the first time. It's a really exciting acquisition. It really epitomizes the excellence in craftsmanship that you would expect from any work being acquired into the V&A collections. Curator Melanie believes this contemporary work has earned its place in the heart of the museum, beside the monumental cast courts, where it will join some of the V&A's most celebrated sculptures. It's now being installed, ready for a special visitor. Of course, there's a little bit of anxiety as it's installed, thinking, is this the right place? Is what we've discussed on paper going to look right in the environment? It feels even more a responsibility when you are putting on display the work of a living artist because they're there to see it. And it's a big thing to have their work in a museum like the V&A. So you want to get it right. There we go. Lovely, lovely. Okay, that's pretty good. Melanie doesn't want to hide the sculpture in a case, but to show it on open display. A little bit more to it, Ellen. Stop, thank you. I don't want it to be behind glass. I want people to be able to see it without any kind of barrier. And what is the safest way to display it as well, to ensure that it can be preserved for future generations? To secure the piece, they must pass a metal rod through the middle of the sculpture and screw it to a specially made plinth. The only problem is that the hollow area within the piece is quite tight. Um, so they need to come up with the exact positioning. With the final adjustments to the lighting... I think it will really make it pop. Now it's ready to be seen in situ by the artist, Eleanor Lakelin herself. Her work is displayed within the heart of the cast courts. You know, her work is close to the cast of Michelangelo's David and next to Trajan's column. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, my, my. Wow. Oh, gosh. Wow. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? It looks great. It's amazing. Oh, my goodness. It's just, just by right Trajan's here. column. Yes. OK, that's really <laughs> fabulous. I love that. I always come here. My, oh, every time I come, I go here because I just love that. The contemporary piece complements the monumental 19th century cast courts that have drawn crowds since the museum was first opened. But it's really lovely seeing those, uh, or just seeing that playing against each other. It's lovely for me, for, for, for my piece. Came here quite a few times when I was working on columns and thinking about columns. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm so, so pleased. You have no idea. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very proud moment, obviously. I look forward to bringing my family to have a look. As a curator, it's really thrilling to be able to celebrate the work of a woman artist, of a woman artist of such quality.
quality and I really hope she will be inspiring other young women to follow in her footsteps. It's really exciting having contemporary work yeah. alongside things that have, you know, have been around for centuries. She was saying how, as a young girl growing up in the woods in rural Wales, she would not have imagined herself as an artist, let alone an artist on display in a great museum like this one. In the cafe, the renovation is now complete. And another piece of craft and design created more than a century ago is ready to be put on display for the first time. Oh, that's a look. Yeah, that Thank looks you. really good. At last, the conservation of the flamboyant Minton Majolica vase is finished. Just in time for the new cafe's grand opening. Ceramics like this, they really look their best in natural light, so it's fantastic that we have it in such an amazing location which is so well lit. You can really see the colours so vibrantly and it's kind of gleaming. This is definitely the right choice of object to go in this space. This amazing example of Minton Majolica and fits really well with the other Majolica spaces around it. I hope the public like it as much as I do. It was quite funny when it was being installed, just seeing the very comical satyr head just being raised into view. It put a smile on my face, so I hope it does the same for all the visitors as well. It's the moment of truth for one of Dame Shirley Bass's most beloved outfits. I'm very excited today because I'm going to see the costume on the mannequin for the first time. And it's a chance for curator Simon to appreciate Susanna's delicate repairs to the skin-tight catsuit. Wow. It looks, looks amazing. It's impossible to see where where the work has been done, Susanna. Oh, yeah. It's very difficult, <laughs> I'm glad to say. So I know where they job. are. You see it the way that the the embellishment and those wonderful beads just bring this wonderful aspect to it. How they add to the shaping of the costume yeah. and the definition. Exactly. I can't wait to see the cape. That's what I really <laughs> want to see now. That catsuit is only one part of the ensemble. Uh, the cape brings a whole new level to that performance. Designer Douglas Darnell often made lavish matching capes for Dame Shirley to wear when she stepped out on stage for an encore. Wow. Isn't it beautiful? Wow. There she is. Wow. Look at that gold. That says luxury, doesn't it? Yes. It says extravagance. <laughs> the final piece of this outfit is a gold lame lined cape trimmed with turquoise blue ostrich feathers. Wow. And further embellished with aquamarine sequin embroidery. I mean, it's stunning, isn't it? Absolutely stunning. <laughs> the colours. I mean, this certainly, you will not be able to walk past this in the galleries. <laughs> I mean, this is what you call a showstopper. Yeah. yeah. That is a showstopper. It is astounding to be here, staring almost at Dame Shirley Bassey herself. And I think what's really remarkable is under these lights, you can see the patination of the sequin embellishment are diamonds. And that's wonderful. Another link to Diamonds Are Forever. Finally, the stellar costume is on its way to the gallery, ready to meet the public once more. Oh, wow. Look at that. You see her sparkling already. <laughs> Fabulous. It is an honour to have such an amazing piece. And I hope that we have done Shirley Bassey herself justice. And I would like to think that she'd be very happy that it was on display. And it is really testament to her and her amazing career. And we can't wait for the visitors to come and enjoy it just as much as we are.
Having repaired the tear in the Chinese King painting, Susan is applying the finishing touches to the surface. I'm really uh, looking forward to see number eight. I'm really grateful for our conservators who invest so much time and energy on conserving them. When curator Hong Xing last saw the painting of King VIII, it had just emerged from storage for the first time in over 150 years. Hello. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm OK. Yeah, good to see you. It's all beginning to, um, to, to, to show up. Now it's a lot cleaner than it was. It looks so, so different. It's quite oh, vibrant, it is. isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so her earrings here have, been, you know, sort of shown up a lot more, and there's quite a lot of detail on the fabric. And then there's quite a lot of work's gone on him because he's sort of very central mm -hmm. and had quite a bit, really, bits this, and pieces. It's really, it's coming up. So I like the gory bits. It's interesting that it's not like our crucifixion where you only put it in the hands and the feet, but yeah. he's got it in his legs and his arms too. Nice. Yeah. So it's a king of fairness. Mm. Yeah. I thought so. I quite like these the details. The blinds oh. are here. Yeah. Yes. King Eight will remain on the board until it's time for him to go downstairs. The king will need a whole year to dry out before he will be ready to display in the gallery. Then King Seven will arrive. I'm looking forward to King Seven. You know, it's awful, isn't it? And there I am, I've been working on King Eight and I've already ditched him. <laughs> looking forward to King Seven now. So yeah, King Seven, roll on. <laughs> Meanwhile, the king that Susan has spent 18 months preparing is now sufficiently dry to display. King number nine is taking his place in the gallery. Very exciting. Today we are installing number nine and uh, very exciting. Great. Great. Happy? Yeah. Yeah. It's very happy. Thank you so much. That's, uh, wow. Finally, yeah. Another two years, eh? Another two years. <laughs> we have uh, another eight to go, so in 16, in <laughs> next 16 years. I hope maybe at uh, one point we could uh, somehow put them together. I, by that time, uh, I might uh, have retired. My successor maybe have this exhibition idea and maybe one day put all 10 paintings together and I will come to see them. Next time, a case belonging to one of the most famous politicians of all time causes sleepless nights. I do have nightmares. You just lie there thinking, oh my God, did I make the right decision? It's removal day for a 350-year-old doll's house. How long do you think it's going to take? Optimistically, maybe a week. Oh my God. Say. And curators discover the story behind a landmark stage play. Using words like that, good Lord. To find out what it's like to be a museum curator and have a go at curating the V&A's collection yourself, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash secrets of the museum and follow the links to the Open University.